Bring this back. The whole bridge just fell down. Start, start, whoever, everybody. The whole bridge just collapsed. An unthinkable tragedy. An iconic bridge carrying tens of thousands of people every day has collapsed. All of our hearts are broken. It looked like something out of an action movie. My husband woke me up this morning. He said, Press, the, the key bridge is gone. I couldn't believe it. I'm heartbroken. News 4 is working for you, trying to answer some of the big questions about how it happened, the Mayday call that saved lives, and the massive ripple effect it will have on your everyday life. It just seems to have been the worst possible for what happened. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. A state of shock. That is how Governor Wes Moore described the state of Maryland after a cargo ship collided with a pillar supporting a part of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore and caused it to collapse. Thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Sean Yancey. And I'm Tommy McFly. It is Tuesday, March 26th. It's not just the state of Maryland that's in shock tonight. Really the entire nation, as we can now report, that six construction workers on the bridge at the time of that crash are presumed dead. And just moments ago, the Coast Guard announced they're officially moving from search and rescue posture into a recovery operation. Take a look at this dramatic video that shows the moment the ship hit the bridge's supports and then the bridge appeared to crumble, then collapsed into the Patapsco River. Here's a timeline of what we know happened. A cargo ship known as Dolly left the port of Baltimore for a 27 day journey just before 1 a.m. Now the ship the ship short journey, you can see it here along the Patapsco River. According to Marine Traffic Tracker, VesselFinder.com, the Singapore flagged container ship was headed for Sri Lanka and expected to arrive April 22nd. But at 1.24 a.m., the ship's lights began to flicker and someone made a mayday call. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said that emergency call gave officials enough time to begin closing the bridge to vehicle traffic before the ship slammed into it and it likely saved lives. The Coast Guard received initial reports of the collision just before 1.30. It's a 948-foot container ship it hit the bridge. It collapsed immediately. People who live nearby described that moment of impact. I woke up to my house vibrating and the big bang is what, I, what woke me up out of bed. The whole house vibrated like an earthquake. It was like an earthquake hit. And the bang was unbelievable, like a bomb went off. It sounded like a bomb went off. Over the next few hours, an intense search and rescue effort ensued. Officials announced that at least eight people were on the bridge at the time of the collapse. Two people were pulled out of the water at that time. And again, crews are now in recovery mode, looking for those six other workers who were on the bridge. The construction company told us, as we've reported, they are presumed dead. Um, again, well, in an update this afternoon, the NTSB said its top priority is supporting all the people affected by this tragedy. Right now, it's about people. It's about uh, families uh, and uh, Addressing the needs of those that were impacted, that's the focus. Now, according to the Maryland Transportation Authority, as many as 31,000 vehicles used that bridge every single day. Now all of those people will be forced to find alternate routes. That bridge is more than a mile and a half long, so high in the air. It carries Interstate 695 over the Patapsco River. Adam Toss has been talking to drivers and taking a closer look at the impact on traffic. In an instant everything changed. Holy, uh, you know, and was like the, the bridge is gone. Carrie Johnson says her fiance heard the loud bang of the collapse early this morning, but it wasn't until the sun came up that the true devastation was revealed. And it's gone. Uh, you know, the, the, what you typically see of your, your everyday skyline is, is just gone. A Barbara Bunn says she's been over the bridge by car and under by cruise ship. It always made her nervous. I don't like crossing the bridges. I don't like cross, driving across the Bay Bridge. I mean, I don't like heights anyway, but uh, even going under it, it was a little scary being on, a, it's on the cruise ships. Everybody gets up on the front to watch it. Pictures from Baltimore City fire crews show the scene up close. The weight of the bridge and the wreckage tangible through the photos. Meanwhile, the transportation impact will be long lasting. 31,000 vehicles per day use the key bridge, 11.3 million vehicles per year. Maryland Transportation Secretary Paul Wiedefeld says I-95 and 895 
two tunnels under the Baltimore Harbor will likely pick up the spillover traffic. About double that use the Harbor Tunnel and double that again use the Fort McHenry Tunnel. So basically we don't have those two other options. Uh, we'll, have, we'll make sure that we have as much uh, personnel out there to deal with any incidents because as you know that can cause the backups very quickly. Signs over I-95 as far north as Delaware warn drivers about the bridge closure. Transit alternatives will be studied here. Now, years ago, when a ship hit and knocked down a bridge in Tampa, it took over six years to rebuild a bridge in that location. And as time goes on, prayers continue for a miracle for those still missing. It's been, you know, way too many hours now. So, you know, that chance is getting smaller. That window is getting smaller and smaller for survival. And, and it's sad. It's really very sad. An early morning tragedy that has rocked communities all along the water. And back here now along the water, you can see a crane being moved in position on a barge, presumably to get as close as it can to the ship. And we can see the ship again stuck there in what was left of the key bridge, almost frozen in time from earlier this morning. And the cleanup is going to take some time. Guys, think about this. If we lost the southeastern part of our beltway, that's essentially what's going on here in Baltimore. 695 is the Baltimore beltway. So what's going to happen with a lot of the traffic that would have come to the southeastern section? It's either going to go through downtown Baltimore, through some of those two tunnels that we were talking about, or go to the western side of 695. That's the part of the Baltimore beltway that goes through Towson. The transportation impact is going to take a long time to sort out. Guys, back to you. That will take mm -hmm. a long time, Adam. Thank you. And when you think about that, downtown Baltimore is going to get busy. Those yep. neighborhoods are going to be even busier. So it'll be interesting to see what officials do to try to, um, you know, reduce the impact. Yep. And folks who live or work in Dundalk and, and use that bridge every day to get across, a lot of changes for Absolutely. the foreseeable future. A lot of big questions of the collapse remain tonight. And these questions we're probably not getting answers to anytime soon. Now, earlier today, our Jumi Olabanji spoke with a George Washington University professor who's an expert in bridge engineering. He shared his thoughts on how the collapse may have happened. Here is the model. This is the three supports. This is span number one, which is a short span, and this is the longest span, which is actually for this bridge is an arch, and this is the third span. So unfortunately, the ship hit this support and over here and toppled the truss which is supporting the traffic of the support. And even the pier over here is badly damaged. So right now, this bridge, after you remove this center support over here, is spanning between this point and this point. And this bridge is not designed to span this long distance. The collapse is blocking what is essentially a cargo ship gateway to the port of Baltimore. From there, the goods travel up and down the East Coast. So the ripple effects of this catastrophic crash are already being felt across our region and could last for months, if not years. Our team coverage continues with Mark Seagraves. He has more on exactly how the tragedy happened and what it means for exactly that shipping industry. Unfortunately, the loss of power at this exact moment was the problem because a few seconds later, uh, they're under the bridge and perhaps run aground. The timing just seems to have been the worst possible for what happened. Sal Mercagliano, maritime historian and host of the YouTube show, What's Going On With Shipping, has reviewed the video of the moments leading up to the catastrophic moment when the ship struck the bridge. The first sign of trouble seen in the video is the ship going dark, apparently losing power. That means every system on the vessel went offline, and that is the worst feeling for a mariner on board. Silence and darkness is the worst. That means you've lost propulsion, you've lost steering, you've lost control of the vessel. Seconds later, the lights come back on. What we're not sure about is whether or not that is the main power coming back on or the emergency power coming back on. If it's emergency power, that means they don't have control. Then thick black smoke is seen coming from the ship's smokestack. That's usually an indication that they're trying to back down the engine, that they're, they're perhaps maybe wanting to try to slow down and stop. We know that they do drop the port anchor because we see it down in the video footage, uh, but at the speed they were going, which is about eight knots, uh, that anchor would not do anything. It would just drag on the bottom. Uh, that was a desperate move to try to stop the vessel. Officials have said the ship was moving at eight knots when it hit the bridge. 100,000 tons at eight knots is a lot of a momentum. 
and it's very hard to control it when you lose uh, propulsion and rudder control. The impact of the indefinite closure of the Port of Baltimore will be felt across the nation. The ships that are in Baltimore are stuck and the ships waiting to get into Baltimore are either going to have to wait or divert. And we're talking about uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollar of impact of cargo. It's not just a matter of we'll offload in Norfolk or Philadelphia. You need the facilities to be able to take them. Uh, cargo is going to have to be rerouted into Baltimore that was scheduled to arrive there. And again, the coal and grain that come out through that port is not going to be able to be taken up in other facilities. The facilities just don't exist. We are just getting an understanding of all of this. Mark Seagraves, thank you for your reporting on that. And tonight, President Biden is vowing to rebuild the bridge and send federal funds. Yeah, the president and Maryland Governor Westmore made it very clear. There is a long road to recovery and rebuilding ahead, but they said the state will prevail. I've directed my team to move heaven and earth to reopen the port and rebuild the bridge as soon as humanly possible. And we're going to work hand in hand with the support of Maryland to support Maryland and whatever they ask for. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. This will not be short. There's going to be a long road. There's going to be a long road, not just as we go from search and rescue. There'll be a long road as we talk about what does the future of this region, the future of the area look like. And we're going to need each and, each and every one of you. Just in this time, this state has been able to show what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. And this state and this city will continue to show exactly that. Not only is this collapse devastating for the families involved and all the people it will affect, the bridge has a very rich history. It opened up back in 1997. The bridge is one of two in the D.C. metro area named after Francis Scott Key, the author of the Star Spangled Banner. He was inspired to write that song after witnessing the bombardment of Fort McHenry in 1814. This is no ordinary bridge. This is one of the cathedrals of American infrastructure. It has been part of the skyline of this region for longer than many of us have been alive. So the path to normalcy will not be easy. It will not be quick. It will not be inexpensive. But we will rebuild together. Now, the bridge was considered a huge engineering feat when it was built back in 1977. People from that area describe this bridge as a staple in the city skyline that is now missing. And Baltimore's mayor is calling today's collapse an unthinkable tragedy. News Force Juliana Valencia spoke with residents who say they're heartbroken over the loss. My husband woke me up this morning. He said, press the, the key bridge is gone. I couldn't believe it. I'm heartbroken. I've got so many pictures of the key bridge. They're all over my phone. The key bridge was Priscilla Thompson's favorite part of her apartment. This apartment's not much, but it had that steel. The view of what she calls a work of art built by people she knows. Priscilla is part of the same iron workers union that built this bridge. It's the pride of Baltimore, that key bridge, not only just what it signifies as far as Francis Scott Key and the national anthem, being written right here at Fort McHenry, but as an iron worker and to appreciate that for the structure, the magnificent engineering and workmanship that went into that. This more than a mile and a half structure has been a major thoroughfare, part of Baltimore's Beltway for close to 50 years. It's like an old friend, you know, it just, it just, you know, every morning I go, I, no matter what the temperature, or even if sometimes, even if it's raining, you know, I go out there, stand along the fence, look out there. Sometimes I even go down onto the pier. That's where I go fishing at. There's a lot of heartbreak here on what's been lost. The concern over this as a commuter route will be dealt with. The focus now is on those still missing. My heart goes out to these families and everything. They have people that were on the bridge and all. I just never really, you know, seen such devastation like this. In and Dundalk, Maryland, Juliana Valencia, News 4. And again, the Coast Guard has just informed us moments ago that they're moving from a search and rescue posture to a recovery effort. And the boats will be in the water overnight monitoring conditions. And the Coast Guard also hopes to have divers in the water as early as Wednesday morning tomorrow. News 4 will continue to follow this story both on air and online. You can find all of the latest information on NBCWashington.com and in the NBC Washington app.
All right, now here's a look at some of the other top stories we're following tonight. The Supreme Court justices are hearing oral arguments in a case that could limit access to a commonly used abortion drug. The high court is reviewing an appeals court decision restricting mifepristone access, which rolls back the FDA's uh, decision to make the pill easier for people to get. Mifepristone is a commonly used abortion drug that's been prescribed for decades. Virginia health officials are warning about a rise in reports of monkeypox cases. So far this year, the state has reported 12 cases, the same number it reported in all of 2023. Cases have been reported all across the Commonwealth, by the way. The state's Department of Health says many of those who are affected by this are men who have sexual encounters with other men. The judge presiding over the New York criminal case against Donald Trump slapped the former president with a partial gag order. A Trump campaign spokesperson said the order is unconstitutional. The ruling bars the former president from talking about witnesses and court staffers in the case. The case is set to go to trial April 15th. Three Maryland middle school students are facing hate crime charges. The Calvert County State's Attorney's Office says 13-year-old students who attend Plum Point Middle School in Huntingtown are charged. The documents show that these students displayed swastikas, performed Nazi salutes, and made offensive comments to a classmate because of that classmate's religious beliefs. And thanks for being with us here still on The Rundown. We're going to be tackling truancy, a brand new bill that aims to reduce the chronic truancy in the district. Derek Ward explains how local lawmakers are trying to keep kids in school. And the NFL season may be over, but commander's leaders already have their eyes on the future. Our insider J.P. Finley spoke with team owner Josh Harris about where the future commander stadium could be built. And welcome back to the News 4 Rundown. Truancy remains an issue all across the country. And here in the district, lawmakers are trying to do something about it. News 4's Derek Ward has more on the efforts to address chronic truancy. According to D.C.'s Office of the State Superintendent of Education, there are 11 D.C. public high schools with chronic truancy rates higher than 70 percent to have chronic truancy rates hovering around 80 percent. This week, Ward 6 D.C. Council member Charles Allen introduced the Chronic Absenteeism and Truancy Reduction Act, focusing on the schools with the highest rates. It aims at addressing the reasons behind the numbers. Chronic truancy unexcused absences should be the red flag that is going off that tells us something's not right with this kid, with this uh, family. A report from the state superintendent's office says 43 percent of D.C. students were chronically absent from school last year. They were absent at least 10 percent of the time they were supposed to be in school. Could be challenges within a home. It could be trouble getting to and from school. Um, it could be um, the need for more support for our students. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a mom who said to me, when it's sunny and 65, she keeps her kids home. She's not convinced her kids are going to get to and from school safely. Language in the Truancy Reduction Act would designate schools where absentee rates are higher than 20 percent as priority areas for the Safe Passages, Safe Blocks program, where adults are posted in areas around the schools to see the students get to and from school safely. Making sure that the Safe Passage um, workers are supported to be able to provide our students um, support um, and making sure that it's well funded. Funding at the school is addressed by the Truancy Reduction Act, too. The bill would add a category for additional funding at the schools with high truancy rates, things like staffing and programs that would provide some early intervention before it becomes an issue for the police or child and family services. When child and family services is knocking on your door, that's because they're coming in to investigate neglect. Uh, they're coming in to evaluate, should that child be removed from that home? If that's the only intervention, that is intervening way too late. The bill would give principals broad authority to determine how any truancy intervention monies would be spent. Derek Ward, News 4. Visa and MasterCard settled an estimated $30 billion deal today with merchants over limiting card fees. Now, Visa estimates that more than 90% of those merchants are small business owners. They've long accused the credit card giants of charging inflated swipe fees when people make purchases with their debit and credit cards. Today's settlement will roll back fees for three years and cap rates for five years. And better late than never, right? This week, a family returned overdue books to a Kentucky library after nearly 100 years. Wow. Miriam Pillamuter checked out a book out of the Louisville Public Library 98 years ago. She was a Russian 
Jewish immigrant, and one of the books she checked out was a Russian language guide. A book of musical composers was also checked out by Miriam's son. This week, though, the family returned those books. He would be so happy that we're all together. He would be so happy that the books were returning. He'd be so happy that he was on television and that his name was continuing. Delinquent fees for these books would have been hundreds and hundreds of dollars, but the library stopped collecting those fees in 2021. The books are now super special. They're headed to a collection that will be held behind glass. That was nice of them to give them back because some people just would have kept the books. Yeah. You know, that was really nice. A little history there. 100-year-old books on eBay, too? You never know what those might be <laughs> bringing in. Right now in Orlando, the annual NFL owners meeting is underway. Our team insider J.P. Finley is there. He spoke with Commander's owner Josh Harris and head coach Dan Quinn about the team's future stadium. The NFL annual meeting is a busy place, but I made a point of asking NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell about the congressional momentum surrounding RFK Stadium. Goodell says he wants the stadium back on that RFK site and that he's been talking with Mayor Muriel Bowser. But what about Josh Harris, the commander's owner, who's talking with officials from D.C., Maryland, and Virginia? We're doing site plans across three jurisdictions. We're in deep discussion with Maryland, but at the same time, we're uh, continuing to uh, pursue, um, you know, the possibility of having a site at RFK. While the stadium deal is pressing, it probably won't happen anytime soon. What's coming up soon? The NFL draft. And the commanders hold the second overall pick. Do you want to tell me which quarterback you like? Uh, after you tell me which one you like. I like Jaden. All right. Well, I'm not going to tell you mine. <laughs> Fair no, enough. The, uh, honestly, we're still going through the whole process. Sure. And you know what's cool? This is a really good crew of guys, you know, that we're getting a chance to evaluate at quarterback and in some other spots as well. So um, we're fortunate that we're going to be in a spot um, at a number of rounds. There's going to be some really good players for us. Uh, but to say where we're at yet would just that'd be inaccurate. My last one, you went to Salisbury. Yep. About 20 minutes to Ocean City. That's right. How much fun in college was being 20 minutes from Ocean City? Yeah, it was a cool spot to go to school, and uh, it was good for summer jobs too, and all that to go. Did you work at yeah, those beach yeah. bars? Yeah, oh or yeah, anything? absolutely. Where at? So did a lot of bouncing down at uh, different days, different spots, and so. Um, like but Fagers? It was, oh yeah, all that they were there, and uh, Secrets was there even back then. But uh, it was an absolute blast, you know, going to college there and meeting a lot of lifelong friends. I would not. If you were the bouncer, I would have behaved. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Quinn as a bouncer, I think, would make even the most rowdy college student behave. In fact, I want to report officially, I've never been thrown out of a bar in Ocean City. Dewey might be a different matter. Covering the Commanders in Orlando, I'm J.P. Finland. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin just vetoed 30 bills that would have placed new restrictions on safety or placed new restrictions or safety rules on guns in the state. The Democrat backed bills included a measure to ban assault rifles. The governor also vetoed the so-called safe storage bill. It would have required guns be locked up in homes where minors live or are likely to be present. The governor wrote the measure would interfere with gun owners access to firearms in their homes. He also vetoed a bill to reinstitute a waiting period for a gun purchase. Governor Youngkin did sign one bill that prohibits the sale or transfer of what's called an auto sear. It's a plastic device that converts ordinary firearms into automatic weapons. All right, back now to our coverage on the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Several local rescue groups and police departments are now headed to Baltimore to help out with those recovery efforts. That includes the Prince George's County Police Special Operations Division's Marine Unit and nine of their divers and two boats are assisting in the bridge collapse over the Patapsco River. The Prince George's County officials will remain on the scene to help in any way that they're needed. And all day, our teams have been working for you, bringing you the latest behind the scenes, in the field, here on the air of the developments of the collapse in Baltimore. As this day comes to an end, we're going to take you back through the sights and sounds of this unthinkable day. Yo! What the? There were workers on the bridge, and there's an unknown amount of those workers in the water. Um, but. Be advised, uh, the, the key bridge is gone. This morning, our state is in shock. As we say good morning and welcome into News 4. It has been a very busy day so far. But never would you think that you would see, physically see, the key bridge tumble down like that. It looked like something out of an action movie. My husband woke me up this morning. He said, Press, the, the key bridge is gone. I couldn't believe it. I'm heartbroken. 
It felt like an earthquake, sounded like a, just a big boom, as loud as you could imagine. It shook my bedroom. And the bang was unbelievable, like a bomb went off. Holy, uh, you know, and was like, the, the bridge is gone. So we just continue to, to stay on top of this. It's just a heartbreaking story, Jimmy. So many of us have driven over that bridge and, and now it's not here anymore. We know the key bridge. I've ridden over the key bridge countless times. So many of us know the Key Bridge because it is our normal commute. This is a place that is a normal commute route for over 30,000 Marylanders every single day. We have to uh, first and foremost pray for all of those who are impacted, uh, those families, uh, pray for our first responders and thank them, uh, all of them working together, uh, city, state, local, to make sure that we are uh, working through this uh, tragedy.